Okay, we're going to start now. Um, I would like to please come in if you're lollygagging. Um, so I would like to introduce Professor Nakpal. Um, she is a full professor at Harvard University, does some amazing things in collective intelligence and swarm um, intelligence. Um, and recently, I just found out, last year she was um, in Nature um, designated as the top 10 scientists to keep a lookout. So um, you are in for a treat. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Um, so for those of you who may have heard me give a talk before, I usually start with these two images of, which for me are just fascinating examples of collective behavior. So if you look at the image on the left, it's an image of a starfish, but you could also think of a starfish as just a multicellular organism, right? It's a bunch of cells that, have, that are cooperating to create this immense structure that can function, that can locomote, that can eat, that can reproduce. And yet, somehow, it is the product of this really interesting individual that is tiny compared to the size of, uh, of the starfish itself. And on the right-hand side is a termite mound. So this is an example of a termite mound in Australia, and it's several uh, meters high. But it's also the result of collective intelligence. These tiny little centimeter scale insects work together to produce this incredible mound that has a lot of internal structure. It has internal sort of lung-like structures to exchange gases. It has a nest. It has a reproduction center. It's almost like its own organism, like a super organism. And what's really cool about both of these systems is not only are they this complex, large-scale structure from small individuals, um, they also can self-repair. So in the case of the termite mound, if you cut off the top of the termite mound, the termites will actually repair it. Within a period of like a couple of months, they'll recreate all of the structure that they need to without their mound losing function during that process. And in the case of a starfish, which is a model organism for studying regeneration, if you cut off the leg, um, the body will regrow the leg. But in some species of starfish, which to me is super amazing, the leg can regrow the body. So if you think about a program that can do that, that first of all, after catastrophic you know, failure of big parts, can regenerate itself, and then even regenerate itself backwards, it's an amazing kind of program. And these days, one of my more deep fascinations is also with um, army ants and fire ants and weaver ants, where basically, if you think of cells self-organizing, now you've got insects self-organizing at an even higher level, making bridges and rafts and even entire nests out of their own bodies. And so again, there's this example where individuals that are much smaller than the structures they're building can somehow come together and form amazing things. What I think makes a lot of these examples fascinating throughout science is the fact that many of these examples are not like how we think about human organization. So there supposedly is no supervisor, and there's no leader. There's no professor in charge of the research group and chair in charge of the department. Somehow, all these individuals are doing things and seeing things, and it's the collective behavior that has this immense complexity, and it's robust, and it's scalable, and millions of individuals can cooperate. So of course, from a biological point of view, understanding this is understanding the very nature of science, but I think also there's so many engineering reasons why we would want to be able to program this way. So almost any application we can think of with many robots in it, um, or with robotics, is probably going to have many robots, whether you think of robots in search and rescue, or agriculture, or warehouses, or even if you think of just self-driving cars, you're going to have how many self-driving cars are going to be on that road? So we would like to be able to understand both how to control that collective behavior uh, and also understand the failures that might emerge from it. And there's also lots of really cool, exciting work, like what Daniela was talking about this morning, where we can build maybe tiny, tiny robots like bees or tiny um, robots like cells and really push what robotics really means by creating systems that very much have that collective behavior uh, that I was talking about with nature. Um, for me personally, I'm also really interested just fundamentally in how complexity arises from simple agents. And that's one of the fundamental things that we look at in my research group uh, from many different angles. So we look at it from a theoretical angle. How do we make abstract systems that can generate complex patterns? 
Uh, we work closely with biologists who study cells and who study social insects. Um, and we also try to build robotic systems that emulate some of the ideas that you know, excite us about biology. So today I was gonna talk about one project from my group, it's always hard to pick one project, but I picked one project uh, and it's called the Kilobot Project. So the motivating question behind this project is, you know, could we create a robotic swarm that kind of competed or at least gave us a sense of what it would be like to have one of these swarms with many, many individuals cooperating. So of course, here you've got thousands to millions of individuals. Uh, we're gonna start with just a thousand. So could we make a thousand autonomous robots uh, work together? And what would be involved in creating that level of a swarm in our own backyard? Or lab, really. Um, so this project was led, by, uh, led and conceived of by Mike Rubenstein, who's sitting somewhere here. There he is. Um, and this is where we are today. So we do actually have 1,024 a kilo of robots in our lab. Uh, and they're low cost, they're quick to assemble, and we can collectively control them. And we can actually program the, them to do pretty interesting things. So this is one of our most recent, um, really, thousand robot experiments where the robots are self-assembling into a complex shape that we decided ahead of time. Um, maybe the important things to notice is there's a thousand robots. This is an 11 hour experiment, so it's clearly very, very sped up. Um, you can see Mike, so you have a sense of the scale. And there's no global eye, there's no global controller, uh, there's no global signal. All of this is happening by the robots interacting with uh, approximately robots that are three hops away from them. So really small groups that have to cooperate to eventually create this large scale behavior. So for the rest of the talk, I wanted to um, talk about how we got there, what are the tricks that we played, what are the things that we learned, uh, and what are some of the challenges that I think still face all of us in this field. Um, but I wanted to start by saying that of course our work builds on decades of work um, where people have really thought deeply about the challenges of these systems, both how do we build swarms of robots that can cooperate and how do we build large swarms, and also how do we program them to do interesting behavior in both the fields of swarm intelligence and programmable materials and modular robots is really sort of the foundation on which the work uh, we've done has built on. So from the, the previous work, I think it's clear that we have both of these challenges. How do we build something that can sort of sit in this group and how do we um, program them? And scaling up both building and programming actually turn out to be quite hard. So if we wanna build a swarm of 1,000 robots, which you know before maybe you have 20 robots or 100 robots, 1,000 is a pretty big number. And it turns out there's lots of challenges. One of, I think, the biggest challenges for us is that we don't actually know what local behaviors are required. So this connection between what a swarm robot needs to be able to do and what behaviors the group will be able to achieve is something that I think all of us are still figuring out, including biologists and computer scientists. But in this case, if you want to make a thousand robots, every mistake you make costs you both money and time. And so somehow we have to be able to pick a minimal swarm robot even without knowing whether it's sufficient. And I think there's interesting theoretical questions around here to try and figure out what those minimum qualities are. A second issue is also that even after you've made a thousand robots, you have to be able to operate them. So you can't be pressing individual switches on individual robots to start them up. That alone would just take an hour. So it would be a pretty crazy thing to be able to have a system where you have a thousand individuals, you can't have human intervention in the same way anymore. So we really have to think that as well. And we sort of use this coined, um, term coined by James McClurkin of sort of hands-off operation, that somehow we no longer touch any individual robot. So this is what the robot looks like. Um, it has two vibration motors. Uh, it can communicate with robots within a few um, body lengths of itself. And it does so by reflecting infrared off of the surface. So this different kind of locomotion and this different kind of communication were both sort of key elements for us to be able to hit the right cost uh, metric and also to be able to manufacture a really robust system that was easy to assemble. Um, we also thought about scalability. So they're charged by putting uh, six volts across one of the legs and the top so you can kind of shove them onto a surface and charge them together. 
They stay in a low power state. They don't have an on-off button. Uh, and you can easily assemble them and easily manufacture them. And we program them with an overhead controller uh, that actually uses the same infrared channel as the robots use to communicate with each other. So in this way, we can really treat the whole thing as a group. And this is just a simple example of the behavior of a single robot. It turns, it goes straight, and the downside of the vibration motors is it's, it's slow. But even though an individual robot is actually not very precise in moving by itself, as a group, you can actually achieve precision. So here, it's like a simple PID controller where it's measuring distance from its neighbors and it's able to circle them. Okay. So the next challenge is programming them. So how do we get from programming three or four robots to programming a large group? And here too, I think some of the challenges have been known for a long time and there's been a lot of work in this area. Uh, one of the challenges is that of course, we would like to have the same properties ideally that we got with the biological systems. That these systems would be decentralized, you could take out any robot, it would still be robust, it would scale to larger numbers because each one is only doing local interactions and that's all great. But we don't actually know what global behaviors are possible to get from local interactions. What things, where's the boundary between decentralized and hierarchical or centralized? And I think, you know, from my perspective, what I do is try to find out how far can we go with a decentralized system, but I don't really know where that boundary is and I think we're still discovering that. So our approach is really to take inspiration from biology. We can recreate some of the behaviors from biology. But that just puts you up against the next challenge, which is how do we generalize? How do we do something that isn't true in biology? Can we do it like computer science that we compose simple behaviors and create more complex ones? A second challenge in my mind is also that it's actually really hard to prove things about these simple local interaction behaviors. And this is not new. Something as classic as firefly synchronization or audiences synchronizing, it's been like a long time. It took a long time to make even the most basic proofs about those systems. So if you talk to applied math uh, people, they will tell you that these are just sort of classically hard systems. So, you know, does that mean we're not going to be able to prove things about it? And I think that would be very sad. So I hope that as we are able to make breakthroughs in things like flocking and sync and different kinds of collective behaviors, we can get better and better at proving things about collectives so that when we build them, we know what behaviors should emerge. So our approach um, in this particular case is to take simple behaviors that we understand from biological systems and then use a very computer science technique of thinking about a compiler. Could a user give you a shape or something that you wanted and then I systematically compose these collective behaviors that I know to achieve a more complex behavior that I want. And can we then do it in so systematically that we can prove something about the group? So in this case, we actually were able to, and I think that self-assembly is one case where we can do it, but there are lots of complex collective behaviors that we really haven't tackled yet. Okay, so. Here's some examples of collective behaviors on the kilobot robots. I don't have time to explain all of them, but basically we can do pattern formation, we can do things like coordinate formation, we can do classic things like firefly synchronization, we can do light following. And it turns out that if you have all of these basic behaviors, you can kind of control space and time and localization and movement. And all of these things together give you a pretty good library. Maybe we need more but this is actually a pretty good library of algorithms to compose. So if we want to do something as complicated as, say, form a starfish, which we can't do, then there actually has been quite a bit of work thinking about how to self-assemble these shapes. So I've actually picked one of my favorite pieces of work that was Mike's uh, PhD thesis with Wei Min Shen, where they looked at how you could self-assemble something like the starfish. And it uses some of the same uh, collective behaviors that I talked about before, but it's actually a a lot more sophisticated than what we've been able to achieve. So in this case, the starfish forms of the right shape based on the number of individuals that are there, but it can even repair itself. So if you break it, it actually will sort of repair itself. And the algorithms are really, really beautiful, but they're still far from what we can implement. So I'll show you what we can implement. Um, so we have a self-assembly algorithm that composes three different kinds of behavior. So gradient formation is the idea that as information propagates, 
from a source, it can be a sense of distance. So the further away information flows, it's a way of measuring distance from a source. So we can sort of make a pattern. Uh, edge following, I showed you before, a robot can move predictably about another robot. Uh, and positional information is the idea that's been used a lot in sensor networks uh, and other contexts, th which is that if we can measure distances from each other and we can form triangles, we can actually start to figure out where we are relative to each other. And in this way, a whole system can actually form a coordinate system in a distributed way. So all of these are reasonably well understood behaviors that we compose. And this is how our current algorithm looks, and I wanna say it's just one way of doing self-assembly. So the idea is we have a seed, so we have an originating point, um, and robots uh, that are along this pool of unused robots climb along a gradient to basically enter a shape. And I'll just keep doing this, okay. And they edge follow till they enter the shape, and then they find a place in the shape where they can attach. So if you think about it, all of the robots are looking for work, and when they find a place where they can do their work of being part of the shape, they stick. So everything starts peeling off, and it starts going in, and it starts sticking, and then eventually all of the robots sort of dissolve, and you get this large shape. And what's interesting in this system is that, first of all, two robots turned white, which actually has no, I'm, I have no idea why this happened. So separate from that interesting part of PowerPoint, um, every time you do the shape, it's slightly different. And that's because the robots never actually do things exactly the same. So somehow we have to have algorithms that can work when there's variation and noise in the position of the robots each time. And the nice part is this algorithm actually does work. So Mike and Alex uh, Cornigio proved that in an idealized setting, this algorithm can, can make any simple connected shape. So this means that you could give it the letter H or the letter, not the letter A, um, the letter E, uh, and probably we could extend it to do other kinds of shapes as well. So this is really nice, except it didn't really work. <laughs> okay, so it turns out that running an algorithm on a thousand robots was, I mean, part of the reason of building it was to learn something. And what we learned was that there were many things about scaling up that we really hadn't thought about. And I picked, I think, the top three lessons, but I actually think that we're continuing to do more experiments, and so we actually probably have a lot more lessons to learn, but I'm gonna pick my top three first, is that there are a lot of physical effects, which we know, robots push each other robots, they move around, but these can often cascade, and those sort of series of interactions that can happen in a large group are really, really hard to predict until you run a few experiments. Um, the second thing we learned is, is having high variation. So we're all used to the idea that robots are noisy, but what we found is with a thousand robots, robots are predictably noisy. So if you think of a traffic lane, and you think of a traffic lane uh, with lots of drivers, all drivers have, you know, you can make some stochastic model, but some drivers are just slower than others, and some drivers are just more reckless than others. Well, we had slow drivers and we had reckless robots, and that was an interesting thing which we just had not ever modeled in our simulation, that we would have these persistent variation. And so it's not just in speed, it was also in measuring distances. So if I measure distance to you and you measure to me, we're always off in one direction. And we found that many algorithms are actually very sensitive to this, including traffic. Um, similar idea is this notion of rare events. So with 20 robots, you take out the robot that misbehaves and you replace it. With 100 robots, it gets a little trickier. With 1,000 robots, every rare event that we had never observed before happened because the probabilities are such that it's now going to happen to you. And so we discovered that rare events, for example, robots just getting stuck, not all algorithms are sensitive, but some are. Traffic is a great example. So, you know, a robot, a, a driver is slow, you get this whole backup and jams. But if a driver turns around and decides to drive in the wrong direction, that's gonna be a pretty interesting highway. That's like what movies are made of, right? So many of my favorite movies, there's always a chase going in the wrong direction. So in our case, these rare events could take the whole system down, and all you need is one. 11 hours, 1,000 robots, you're going to get one. So what we found is that it's not enough, actually, to just make these robust algorithms. We actually had to make new algorithms, algorithms that in some sense were looking and eliminating rare, rare errors, um, algorithms that were more resistant to variation, uh, and it's an interesting idea that maybe as we have more and more robots, 
What we actually can't do is make better and better algorithms. What we'll have to do is make like an immune system where you really have robots that are dedicated to removing badly behavior robots. You can't really just fix every algorithm to accommodate an arbitrary amount of noise. And so we had to add certain algorithms, for example, to find these robots that were misbehaving in the traffic kind of situation and actually cause them to decide to reboot themselves or take themselves out of the process or something. So it was actually a very interesting um, system. I think we also, just in general, have a lot to understand about emergent properties of existing algorithms. There are many things about the algorithms that we use that we thought we understood really, really well. Uh, and one of the things I think is just this idea that there are actually very specific error patterns that happen. Some, some programs are very sensitive to rare errors. You have a rare error, but that rare error turns into a cascade of errors. Some cases, rare errors just get absorbed. So understanding which algorithms are gonna be sensitive and sort of amplify small errors is actually something that I think we still don't fully understand, in part because our simulators aren't capturing all of the things that are happening physically. And now with it, we have this thousand robot system, we can actually try these things, run experiments with 10, 100, 1,000 robots, and try to uncover what are the things about these algorithms that we didn't mathematically model that perhaps we can mathematically model now. Okay, so I'll just show you two sort of close-up videos, uh, two videos of the system. So here you can actually see one of the robots starts, and then it gets stuck, and then the other robots actually know to move around it. Uh, as this zooms out, you can kind of see this is our sort of traffic example where all of the bad parts about traffic came out. Um, some cases you can actually see caravans or you can see places where it was difficult to traverse and the robots start jamming up. But we had to do a lot of things to get this system to work. This is, a, this is what it looks like as the robots are actually joining into the shape. And every time the pattern looks different. So when we ran the same algorithm multiple times, it was kind of like seeing finger patterns. You get the same overall shape, but the internal thing is like fingerprints, which is actually kind of cool. This is actually a part that was, I think, much more robust in a sense. Okay, so once you have the algorithm and once we added in those strategies for fixing rare errors and for uh, detecting variation, we actually could run lots of things with 1,000 robots, where lots is three, with 1,000 robots that were very predictable. But what, when I say, what I wanna say is, again, no global control, no global eye, and all of these ran successfully on the first try which actually usually none of my robotic experiments are like that. So I think that we actually really learned something by pushing up the scale, by realizing that if we didn't want to have human intervention, we actually had to think about a lot, a lot of a bigger space of interactions between robots than we did before. Nevertheless, you know, this is still robots on a plane, and if you look at the diversity of behavior that we have in biological systems, it's huge. Um, there are robots that, you know, ants that are assembling on top of each other, fish that are flocking through great, you know, areas, uh, termites that are building uh, large structures, and we're trying to take inspiration from these systems and build different systems, but I think there's just a lot to learn about how we can, how we can create this kind of collective behavior. And for me, one of the things I also enjoy is that the biologists I talk to also don't know what's going on, and sometimes, the robotics is a way to test out different ideas. And so now you can actually purchase and easily use kilobots. And we have two groups, one a cell biology group and one uh, a social insects group that each own 100 robots each and are using the robots to uh, do different things and, and think about different ideas. And very soon in the UK, there will be another, uh, another swarm of equal size, about 1,000 robots in, in Roger Gross's group. Uh, and James Marshall, who's a social insect person, is planning to use them. So I think this is going to be a really interesting platform that we can use for creating and, and thinking about new ideas. Okay, I'm barely on time. All right, so um, the other thing I wanted to say about collective intelligence uh, is that all of the research I presented is itself the product of collective intelligence. And I'm really lucky to be part of a really amazing group of people over the years. Uh, the kilobot research, as I said, was really started by Mike. Um, but there's a huge number of people who, from the group, have participated in building pieces of har hardware, designing ideas, programming. And so really, this has been a major group effort. Uh, and I think that collective, to me personally, is equally important to the, to the swarm collective ideas that we have. How do we create groups? How do we create communities that actually function well together? And so 
Um, how many people here are students? Okay, all right, so this is for you. So this is me. <laughs> um, so the last thing I wanted to say um, <clears throat> is a little bit about collective culture. And this is me. Uh, I like to paint. Uh, I like to design nerdy t-shirts and wear them. Uh, I like to watch Bollywood movies, and I like to spend lots of times with my kids. And I don't read email between Friday and Monday, generally. Uh, and I have certain ways in which I have a particular life. And I think it's great. And I think that what troubled me a little bit was that somehow being that was unacceptable. That somehow being that was somehow not fitting in. And so I think that collectively, we have a way to change the culture, to be more inclusive, to be more accepting of people as whole people, um, and to be a little bit more um, interesting. <laughs> but sometimes it can feel very hard as an individual to walk up and say, I don't fit the stereotype or I don't believe what the system is. And I certainly have felt that way a good part of my career. But I do think that if all of us do it, as a collective, we really have the power to change it. And so it's not really me who's gonna determine what it means to be a roboticist tomorrow. It's really those of you who are students. And I hope that you will think very deliberately about what kind of collective intelligence you wanna create in our community. And that's what I have to say. Thanks. So we have time for uh, a few questions, if anyone has any questions. Thank you, very, very impressive. Uh, so you must know the science fiction movie, Baymax. Yeah. There are millions of <laughs> modular robots. We just so, watched it as a group together. Yeah, recently. yeah, uh, in your opinion, how long can this be uh, in the reality, in the future? What is the main bottleneck technology? Thank you. Mike will be starting his own group, so it'll all be his fault if it doesn't happen within the next five years. I think, you know, so we cheated in one big way, which is, which is gravity. But, you know, so we're doing things in 2D, and doing things in 3D has turned out to be really, really difficult. And part of it is an issue of scale. The scale at which I'm operating is not the scale at which army ants are solving this problem. So I think there is something really fundamental that if we, if we do break that, then potentially we could make things the size of army ants that actually adhere to each other. I mean, there are lots of ideas in this conference that could make it possible. How we make that system autonomous, I think, is a completely different one. I feel less confident that even if we build it, that we would be able to program something in three dimensions that does it. But I don't know. I could just be slightly pessimistic. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think getting to the getting to the movies, I would love to get to the part to the good part of the movie, and then we just not get to the other bad part of the movie where it, it does evil things. But yeah, we think about this all the time. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, um, I have rather technical question, or a little bit more technical question. Uh, this rare events. Uh, if we are talking about 1,000 robots, how do you really debug them? I mean, how do you understand the, the reasons and how do you fix How do we understand what the event was? Or yeah, I mean, wh wh what, what was the uh, cause for the event? Yeah, so I think the first example that we saw was actually that robots' motors get stuck. This is not a surprising thing that sometimes the vibration motors get stuck. Um, but we thought we had calibrated all the robots to sort of prevent this from happening. But in 11 hours, there's a very small probability that that will happen. And the robot can't detect that it's not moving. As far as it's concerned, it's sending power to its motors, but the motor is not moving. So it's basically sitting around doing a very destructive behavior. And, and because it causes everything else to stop, it was really hard not to notice that error, Does, if that makes sense. In the other cases where we're now systematically looking for it, another kind of error is where you've created a system where you think you've reduced the message loss probability below something, right? But then every so often, the message loss, for reasons unexplainable, is higher than that, right? And the question is, is that gonna be enough to trigger something in your system that just causes a cascade? 
And that's what we realized. We just were running gradient algorithms, which is basically message hops incrementing away. There's no movement. But you run it on small groups of robots, you don't, it always converges and looks great. You run it on bigger groups, every so often something happens. A little spark, some robot makes a mistake. But then it just causes this cascade where somehow you broke all of the, the protection that was supposed to be there. And I think you know, we will probably learn something about that. And maybe what we'll learn is that you can't prevent the rare errors that cascade. You can just make them lower and lower and lower probability. And then as you get bigger and bigger, you're basically playing a game of like them actually happening. And then maybe there's other protection mechanisms you could do at a higher level that says, well, you know, don't, don't bl rely on a gradient for longer than X amount of time or something like that. So I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, this is sort of current area of research for us. Actually, one of the reasons I don't have any robots right now is because somebody is running a thousand robot experiments trying to find what are the causes of those rare errors. So hopefully in a year or so, we'll have a, I'd have a better answer for you. But those, I think, Message and communication are two fundamental things that the robot is doing. I think the third one would be computation, but we haven't really noticed, I think chips are just a lot more reliable. We haven't noticed any of those kind of errors where it actually executes the wrong program or something. All right, if there are no more questions, let's give our speaker a great round.